Thanks for tuning in to leftcoastnews.net, news and information from the wacky, sometimes communist, liberal West Coast of the United States. For more, visit leftcoastnews.net. Well, the joke that is the Washington court system, justice or injustice system, strikes again. Wednesday, July 3rd, a 16-year-old boy decided to pull out a gun at the Alderwood Mall in Linwood, Washington, and shoot at some people he was having some kind of argument with. And he struck and killed a 13-year-old girl who was not even involved in the disturbance and killed her. And the courts decided it would be a good idea to let this guy out of jail. Jada Woods Johnson, 13, was fatally shot at Alderwood Mall on Wednesday evening. Late, later that night, a 16-year-old boy was brought to the police by his mother. He's since been booked into Denny Juvenile Justice Center in Everett. Police think he fired the gun. Of course, he's since been released. He spent one night in the juvenile center and was released. The mall announced Thursday it would remain closed for the day because of the attack. A sign taped to a door said it would reopen Friday at 11 a.m. Around 6 p.m., a fight broke out between two groups of teens at Alderwood Mall. Linwood Deputy Chief Patrick Fagan said, A boy, 16, is alleged to have pulled out a handgun and fired at a group of teens, hitting Woods Johnson, 13, who was not involved in the fight. The girl was rushed to the hospital. People at the mall were told briefly to shelter in place. An entrance to the mall was blocked off while police investigated. Around 11 p.m., Linwood police announced on X that Woods Johnson had died from her injuries. The suspect in police custody, or was, is a 16-year-old boy from Edmonds. He was wearing a white sweatshirt while at the mall during the time of the shooting. He was brought in by his mother and police booked him into the youth detention facility. The gun has not yet been recovered, according to Linwood Police. They're continuing to follow leads and collect evidence. Of course, the mayor and the Alderwood Mall both released statements Thursday saying they're heartbroken, they're crushed, they're devastated. It looks like they're anti-gun antics in King and Snohomish County don't work. How does a 13-year-old boy have a gun? A 13-year-old black boy who looks like a gangbanger because one of these news sites posted a picture of him. He looks like a gangbanger and more than likely he is. And this is gang violence, which the state refuses to address. And gang violence has increased drastically in King and Snohomish counties Pierce counties, because of the policies they have, especially in King County, where they don't want to incarcerate juveniles for any crime. And this is sort of the attitude the entire state has taken on. They don't believe juveniles should be incarcerated for anything, including murder. They think there's other ways to deal with youth, crime, and violence. The Edmonds School District said on Instagram, the Briar Terrace Middle School and District Community experienced a heartbreaking loss on Wednesday evening. Counselors will be available at the middle school Friday and Monday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Because now you've got th- this, a crime like this affects all these kids that went to school with this girl who had nothing to do with these turds, right? When when are we going to hold the politicians who have created these issues responsible? When are we going to hold judges accountable, prosecutors accountable for for allowing this stuff to go on, for allowing these criminals back on the streets immediately? Lauren Wegener, a criminal defense attorney not associated with this case, said judges weigh a lot of factors when deciding whether or not to grant bail to a suspect. 
the judge has a lot of discretion to determine whether or not they release somebody on bail or they keep somebody in jail, Wegener said. Wegener said judges use Court Rule 3.2 to help them decide when to grant an individual bail. The rule takes a lot of factors into consideration. Does this person have criminal history? Do they have familial support, community support? Are they a flight risk, danger to the community? Likely they'll commit another dangerous offense. This is what the judge considers. Wegener said she understands the reasoning behind why the suspected shooter was granted bail and will not and will not comfort those who love Woods Johnson. However, she said this is the legal system at work. Under the Constitution, we have the right to be presumed innocent. Well, that may be all fine and dandy. But this guy committed a criminal, a capital act, murder. His mother turned him in, so how much presumption is there that he's innocent? Anyway, Rule 3.2 is five pages long of all kinds of garbage that they consider. But I'm going to read you the first part of it, because that's what applies here. Court Rule 3.2a, presumption of release in non-capital cases. Any person other than a person charged with a capital offense, this is a capital offense, shall at the preliminary appearance or reappearance pursuant to Rule 3.2.1 or CR R I J 3.2.1 be ordered released on the accused personal recognizance pending trial unless the court determines that such recognizance will not reasonably assure the accused's appearance when required or there is shown a likely danger that the accused will commit a violent crime hmm, already has or will seek to intimidate witnesses or otherwise unlawfully interfere with the administration of justice. For the purpose of this rule, violent crimes are not limited to crimes defined as violent offenses in RCW 9.94A.030. In making the determination herein, the court shall, on the available information, consider the relevant facts, including but not limited to those in subsection C and E of this rule. Showing of likely failure to appear, less restrictive conditions of release. This is section B. If the court determines the accused is not likely to appear, if released on personal recognizance, the court shall impose the least restrictive of the following conditions that will reasonably assure that the accused will be present for later hearings, or if no single condition gives that assurance, any combination of the following conditions. 1. Place the accused in the custody of a designated person or organization agreeing to supervise the accused. 2. Place restrictions on the travel, association, or place of abode of the accused during the period of release. 3. Require the execution of an unsecured bond in a specified amount. D. Correction. 4. Require the execution of a bond in a specified amount and the deposit in the registry of the court in cash or other security as directed of a sum not to exceed 10% of the amount of the bond. Such deposit to be returned upon the performance of the conditions of release or forfeited for violation of any condition of release. If the requirement is imposed, the court must also authorize a surety bond under section B5. 5. Require the execution of a bond with sufficient solvent sureties or the deposit of cash in lieu thereof. 6. Require the accused to return to custody during specified hours or to be placed on electronic monitoring if available. 7. Impose any condition other than detention deemed reasonably necessary to assure appearance as required if the court determines that the accused must post a secured or unsecured bond. The court shall consider on the available information the accused financial resources for the purpose of setting a bond that will reasonably assure that the accused's appearance. C. Relevant factors. Future appearance. 
in determining which conditions of release will reasonably assure the accused's appearance. The court shall, on the available information, consider the relevant facts, including but not limited to the accused's history of response to legal process, particularly court orders, to personally appear, the accused's employment status and history, enrollment in an educational institution or training program, participation in a counseling or treatment program, performance of volunteer work in the community, participation in school or cultural activities, or receipt of financial assistance from the government, the accused's family ties and relationships, the accused's reputation, character, and mental condition, the length of accused residence in the community, the accused's criminal record, the willingness of responsible members of the community to vouch for the accused's reliability and assist the accused in complying with conditions of release, <clears throat> the nature of the charges of relevant to the risk of a non-appearance, any other factors indicating the accused ties to the community. Showing of substantial danger, conditions of release. Upon a showing that there exists a substantial danger that the accused will commit a violent crime, or that the accused will seek to intimidate witnesses or otherwise unlawfully interfere with the administration of justice, the court may impose one or more of the following non-exclusive conditions. 1. Prohibit the accused from approaching or communicating in any manner with particular persons or classes of persons. 2. Prohibit the accused from going to certain geographical areas or premises. 3. Prohibit the accused from possessing any dangerous weapons or firearms. Because that works to tell them. Obviously, the 16-year-old, that sure worked, didn't it? He's not even allowed to have a gun. Or engaging in certain described activities or possessing or consuming any intoxicating liquors or drugs that prescribed to the accused. Require the accused to report regularly to and remain under the supervision of an officer of the court or other person or agency. 5. Prohibit the accused from committing any violations of criminal law. Huh. Prohibit the accused from committing any violent... You're not allowed to commit any crime. You're a criminal. Stop doing that. That works. Six, require the accused to post a secured or unsecured bond. Blah, 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 blah about the bonds. Seven, place the accused in the custody of a designated person or organization agreeing to supervise the accused. How about a jail? How about that organization? That's what it's for, for criminals who are dangerous. Eight, place restrictions on travel, association, or place of abode of the accused during the period of release. Nine, require the accused to return to custody during specified hours. Ten, impose any condition other than detention to assure non-interference with the administration of justice and reduce danger to others in the community. Relevant factors showing substantial danger. In determining which conditions of release reasonably assure the accused non-interference with the administration of justice and reduce danger to the others of the, in the community, the court shall, on the available information, consider the relevant facts but not limited to criminal record, willingness of community members to vouch, blah, blah, the nature of the charge, the accused reputation, character, blah, the accused past record of threats to victims or witnesses, whether or not there is evidence of present threats or intimidation directed to witnesses, the accused past record of committing offenses while on pretrial release, probation, or parole, the accused past record of using the use of or threatened use of deadly weapons or firearms, especially to victims or witnesses. Hmm. So, towards the bottom of this, release in capital cases. Any person charged with a capital offense shall not be released in accordance with the rule unless the court finds that release on conditions will reasonably assure that the accused will appear for later hearings, will not significantly interfere with the administration of justice, and will not pose a substantial danger to another or the community. If risk of if a risk of flight, interference, or danger is believed to exist, the person may be ordered detained without bail. Do you think 
some psychotic child who has a gun or has access to guns, this gun is still missing. And now he's been released. He knows where the gun is. So no doubt he has his gun back. If he's willing to go into a mall and start shooting at people because he's having an argument with somebody, a disagreement, and there's bystanders around who get shot, do you think that's a danger to the community? Do you think your kids are safe at the mall with turds like this loose on the streets? Well, apparently Snohomish County feels like that's a good idea, that it's okay for these people to be out, even though he's charged in a capital offense. Released on bail, and there's multiple articles about this. I don't know if it was 500000 or 50000 If it was 500000 that means he had to pay fifty grand to get out of jail. If it was fifty grand, he paid five grand to get out of jail. I want to know who paid that money to get him out. One of these community organizations that likes to go around and bail criminals out more than likely, especially black or brown criminals who can't afford bail. Northwest Bail Project comes to mind. Probably one of those put that money up for that kid to get him out. He has no business being on the street. None. He has no regard for human life if he'll pull a gun out and start shooting into a crowded mall and hit some child. Where is the justice for that child and her family? These politicians and judges and prosecutors and these turd community organizations like Northwest Bail Project, they don't care about anybody's safety or the community. Enough is enough of this. These people need to be held liable. These politicians, judges, people making these decisions to let these criminals out to cause more damage and chaos, they need to be held liable. This kid should be in jail. He never should have gotten out 24 hours after he commits a crime like this. That is sick. That is messed up. And you don't have to be a conservative or a liberal to know that. You know it's wrong. These people belong in jail who commit crimes like this. It doesn't matter what their background is or what their little story is. You know basically right from wrong. And you know you don't pull a gun out and shoot into crowds of people. And if you do, then there should be some consequences for that. It's time for us to speak up and talk to these politicians and the people making these decisions and creating this chaos that we get to live with. So as if that story isn't enough to boil your blood, your Washington lawmakers have failed you again in the criminal justice arena. Two Washington juvenile rehabilitation facilities are suspending intakes of new offenders due to overcrowding according to the Washington State Department of Children, Youth, and Families, DCYF, another great state organization that is run so well and does such a good job. The Echo Glen Children's Center in Snoqualmie and Green Hill School in Chehalis won't be taking any more juveniles until they return to safe and sustainable capacity levels, which could take months. When too many young people are concentrated in small spaces, it can escalate behaviors and limit the ability for therapeutic rehabilitation, said DCYF Secretary Ross Hunter. This was not sustainable. Our facilities must be safe, therapeutic, and functional. This does not mean juvenile offenders will be released, but they will instead remain in a county facility until it is safe for them to be transferred to a juvenile rehab facility. DCYF claims that over the last year, Greenhill experienced an influx of young people entering the facility that outnumbered releases each week. The population of Greenhill went from 150 in January of 23 to 240 in June of 2024, which is 30% above capacity. The agency also says longer sentences are causing the rise in population. 
To deal with the overcrowding, DCYF contracted additional security staff at both facilities. DCYF is also looking at other options to address the safety concerns. However, they do not result in immediate capacity reduction. DCYF says it will maintain a wait list during the suspension to prioritize and manage intakes once the suspension is lifted. The Washington Association of Sheriffs and Police Chiefs released a statement on Saturday urging the state to promptly resolve this issue. The statement from WASPIC's Executive Director Stephen D. Strahan reads, Law enforcement agencies around the state have been notified by the Washington State Department of Children, Youth, and Family Services that due to capacity issues, they will indefinitely suspend acceptance and placement of sentenced juvenile offenders, regardless of the violence or severity of their crime. And I read the letter from DCYF. It said nothing about holding juveniles in county facilities, which most county facilities are not going to accept juveniles because they don't have a place to keep them away from the regular population. So that's not going to happen. That is a lie. The Washington Association of Sheriff's Police Chiefs is cooperating with a DCYF request to inform law enforcement agencies across Washington of the intake suspension. At the same time, WASPIC calls on the state to promptly resolve the issue through any necessary executive or legislative action. Well, that's not going to happen. Not with these political people we have in office. It is wholly unacceptable to simply stop accepting juveniles who have been sentenced through due process for often very violent crimes. Victims of crime need to know that offenders will remain in custody, also not a priority for the state in any way. The situation is largely of the state's own making. The state's overcrowding problem in juvenile rehabilitation centers has been known for some time, and not taking responsibility for the housing of offenders places the public at further risk. One common-sense emergency option that should be considered is the transfer of non-juvenile inmates, 18 to 25-year-olds, no kidding, they're adults, at Green Hill School to the custody of the Department of Corrections for incarceration in adult facilities. But do you think the state's going to do that? No. Do you think the state cares about public safety? No. Do these politicians care about your public safety? Negative. This is just more in line with the fact that they don't want to incarcerate juveniles. They are closing juvenile facilities like Maple Lane, also by Chehalis, closed years ago. They want these people out causing chaos. They seem to think that they can talk to these kids about the their violent tendencies, their gang issues, and somehow work it out by talking. It doesn't work like that. These people are naive or stupid or both, or it's just part of their overall plan to create chaos, which Democrats seem to love. We see these issues all across the country with crime and criminals not being incarcerated for crimes they commit, And Democrats just letting them back out. Liberal judges just letting them back out to do what they will to the general public. Enough is enough. Thanks for listening to Left Coast News. For more, visit leftcoastnews.net. Please subscribe, like, and share to your social media. We appreciate your support.